2016, um, everybody, you know, you may have noticed we had a, a few big events happen here and in Great Britain, 2016. Um, and we were able to see this through Twitches. So two big things kind of caught the world by surprise. We had Brexit, if everyone remembers that event. Uh, then we had the U.S. elections where uh, Donald Trump was elected president. And even before that, we saw another interesting phenomenon occur when Bernie Sanders, um, you know, a very uh, kind of uh, a, a candidate who doesn't look like he would be president, somebody who was very different from your traditional candidate, you know, he went and he competed very strongly uh, against Senator Clinton. Uh, why was this a surprise is the question we had to keep asking ourselves. You know, what, 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 was, what was going on? Uh, and so we saw kind of a transition within the United States and the political body toward a more nationalistic viewpoint. Um, and we began to see things, you know, we, we started to, to monitor uh, a lot of political events. In two, the early 2016, they had the World Economic Forum. James. <laughs> yes. So, uh, does anyone, uh, the World Economic Forum, it's a big event where, where very important people come from around the world. All countries are represented. I think most countries, at least, are represented. And they talk about very important things. And when we monitored that, Jeremy set up the campaign for us. And we saw that the UK exit, Brexit, was the 2,797th most popular topic. Right after that, within a month, the referendum date was announced, June 18th of that year. And six months later, it happened. At that same time, within the World Economic Forum, Donald Trump was the 79th most popular topic. Within four months, within four months, he was the presumptive Republican nominee. Nine months later, he was the president, elected the president. So we began monitoring. That we, we built the Brexit campaign in May, on May 13th of 2016. We looked at three different indicators. We looked at sentiment, we looked at volume, and we looked at motion. We looked at sentiment and we, we normalized it for that period of time. We were able to get an idea. So we had monitored kind of three topics. One was Brexit as an overall topic. Then the yes to EU, this is the, the people who did not want to leave. And then the no to EU, the, the pro-leave faction. And within sentiment, you can see right here, uh, right leading up to the day of the election, this is what we saw. It was tight, very, very tight. But we also saw that the no to EU group really had kind of a sentiment advantage. I always like to talk about sentiment advantages because I like sports and it's easier for me to understand. So we saw that the leave side had held a slight advantage going into it. Um, we look at volume, right? How many people are posting on each side? So the volume of tweets is also very important when looking at an, at an analysis. We saw that the stay folks, the people who were supporting the stay faction, they were at 31% compared to 69% of the leave faction. When we controlled for retweets, it's very important to kind of you know understand how many original tweets we're looking at as opposed to retweets. We saw you know the, the breakout wasn't much different there. 37% were on the stay side, 63% were on the leave side. Then we looked at emotion, and this is really where we see a huge, uh, kind of a huge difference. So emotion, and I know you, you folks are all studying, can, can somebody give me the difference between sentiment and emotion? Joy, one of you? Anyone? What's the difference between sentiment and emotion? Yeah, sentiment, it's uh, either is positive or negative, but emotion has the least of the different uh, kind of the sentiment. Let's say emotion has joy, sad. Yeah. Um, what does it mean to you, though? I mean, are there things that you have? So itself, emotion, if it's sad, it, it, the, the sadness of the emotion can be positive, can be, it can be different degree of that sadness. Yeah. I think this is the uh, most important point. Yeah, because when I think about it, too, when I look at sentiment, there's a lot of things that I might like and I might, might not like, but I'm not, I don't feel strongly about it. Right? If you say, uh, James, do you want to go to uh, the cafeteria for lunch? You know, everyone here is eating at the right state cafeteria. And I might say, yeah, sure. 
but I'm not happy about it, or I don't love it. Right? If you say, James, let's go to Chipotle for lunch, and then I'm really happy. I, I might really, really want to go. And so I look at, you know, that's why when we look at uh, the volume output with sentiment, we might capture 100 tweets, and only 10 of those show emotion. Um, and so really from emotion, we're able to get a lot stronger uh, reading. So right here, this leading up to the, uh, leading right up to the uh, referendum on June 23rd, this right here, this, this bar chart was for leave, joy. So what's that tell us? Leading up to this, what does that tell us? What signal are we trying to read here? Remember, what's the question? And I, I'll go back and say, what's the question we're trying to ask ourselves? We're trying to ask ourselves, well, will the citizens of the United Kingdom vote to leave the, uh, the European Union, or will they vote to stay? And so we're asking ourselves, we saw sentiment. We really couldn't tell a lot from sentiment. We saw volume breakout. The volume breakout looks like it's leaning toward, you know, pretty strongly toward leave. And so we're saying, well, if volume is a factor, then leave may have an advantage. But right here is where we're able to really understand where momentum was going. Those who were posting about leaving the EU were happy about it. They were enthusiastic about it. And so I look at this as an, as an enthusiasm measurement. This is what tells you what people are going to do. You know, everybody's had a, a something in life that they they agreed to. You may have committed to do it, but you're not happy about it, and so you end up not doing it. So, so uh, you you see a conversation about new iPhone, and people say, "Oh, I like it." Well, at what point though you be able to more predict that actually you have a propensity to buy it? It's one thing to say, "Yeah, that's like a good product." Another thing is actually buying, right? There's a big difference between the two. And if you are a brand consultant or you are, you know, somebody who, you, most of the actual user will be interested in the action. What does it mean? Um, you know, what will the market share? Will it increase or not? These kind of questions, answering, these are the more important questions. And answering them is more challenging than simply looking at sentiment. That's a very simple thing beyond that. It's probably even more challenging than just looking at emotion alone e also, but the emotion gives you a different kind of levers, different ways of th thinking about the problem and gives you unique advantage. Yep. And remember also pay attention just for a technical purpose that it is stay discuss versus leave discuss. So you have to do it for topic specific, uh, you know, stay, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the, so it's not just as emotion as such, but for but one way or another way. Yeah, so we wanted to break it out and try to better understand it. Um, and so that day, Dr. Sheth and Jeremy, I doubt Alan was there. He was probably, I don't know, he's never around when we need him. But uh, <laughs> uh, so that day, actually that day I was not around. It was really bad. We were, um, mo or Dr. Sheth and Jeremy were monitoring the campaign. And they did something very unique. And this is, I think, really one of the uh, cool innovations that Dr. Sheth came up with, was essentially conducted what we call the, he calls the, the virtual exit poll. Does anyone know what an exit poll is? So in the United States, when you vote, you walk into the elementary school or wherever the voting booth is, you vote, and you walk out. And sometimes there'll be a college kid, you know, making you have pizza money, and he'll say, he or she will say, well, who did you vote for? And you tell them, and then they record it, and then they go send it out. That's called an exit poll. It means that you could tell them that you vote for Mickey Mouse, and it wouldn't matter. It's not counted for anything, but what they're trying to do is maybe tell a news network, maybe tell a polling organization who, who's going to win before anybody else knows. So Dr. Sheth came up with the idea that we would begin to monitor people who had indicated that they voted. Um, through, uh, I think it was just hashtag. Hashtag, yeah, hashtag I voted. Actually, we did two ways. Hashtags plus, um, uh, you know, we had implemented, um, uh, Jerry Mellon, who uh, implemented this uh, uh, interface where you can type vote star, V O T star, because it, I voted, I am at voting booth, 
the many ways but the conversation is indicative of vote and i'm looking at only that particular day right after the uh, voting has started till the voting is closed so i'm only looking at that period and the conversation talks about vote so i guess it to be one that uh, you know say this person is actually talking about his voting there can be more we can do but this is good enough approximation per se so you have you can look at very specific thing saying i voted and you can also take a little broader thing which would be the higher recall and uh, low precision anything that talks about what vote, vote, voting whatever you know syntactic matches of that i can implement as uh, a classifier to be predictive of voting if i wanted to be even more precise than that so i could have done that but this is the two three ways i did it yep so the question then is should they stay or should they go and that's a uh, classic song title from a British band called The Clash. That's the question we're asking. And we saw at 7 o'clock that day, 7 o'clock, the polls closed at 10. We were seeing leave, very strong advantage. Same thing at 8 o'clock, same thing at 9 o'clock, same thing at 10 o'clock. So before the polls closed, we were able to say, the move is on. Uh, and this happened, Dr. Sheth at 11.30 a.m., which, what time is that in Britain? 4.30. Um, so the sentiment since voting began of surge for leaves continues. It could be a problem. Day closes on a pro Brexit note. Support for Brexit had a much uh, stronger Twitter presence and late momentum in support. So we were able to use and say the polls closed earlier. Uh, we saw it. And what would that mean, though? So what does that mean to... Uh, you know, obviously we know that it was a shock to a lot of people. And, and, and it was a shock to me, but it didn't cost me any money. It didn't make me any money. It didn't have really much of an impact on me yet that I know of. But if we were able to know that beforehand, see this chart right here? This is the value of the pound. Um, so British people call their money the pound. We call them dollars. Like I, I don't know why we didn't uh, take that construct over. but. What happened here, this is, you're, you're seeing this timeline, this is June 23rd. So voting began this day, the value of the pound, when it's green it goes up, and when it's red it goes down. So you see what happened? Right when people started to understand what was really going to go on, if you would have made a trading decision right there, you could have made a lot of money. You could have made a lot of money. Um, and hedge funds were... Uh, were, were stuck. They, they, they were caught from behind. They didn't realize uh, really what was going on. This is where it's been since then. So the aftermath was significant. Uh, the impacts of this were significant. And had the right people been listening the same way that we were listening, they could have avoided a lot of that, that trouble. By uh, the way, by the way it, this is a little bit tricky about making money. So. You could have made made money on the arbitrage of the value of the pound, right? The money, uh, you know, price differential, and by shorting the pound, you could have made money, okay? But you would have lost money if you had uh, predicted this in terms of the stock price. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, that's true. So, so there are there are additional, you know, application specific things that you have to worry about. Just to you know clarify, we made the call. Uh, about two or three uh, three hours before U.S. market closed, right? Mm -hmm. So you could have traded in U.S. market. We made the call uh, before the polls closed there, and uh, the the actual results came out the next day morning there. Seven a.m. six a.m. Yeah, or seven. Three, four, eight. Yeah, it was yeah. pretty late. Right. So so there was about ten hours or more of uh, uh, lead time that we had when we predicted the things. That's a lot of time if. If you're going to make a decision, if you're going to believe in this and make a decision, there's a lot of time. And, and what we saw too, there were betting markets. Uh, there, there's politicalodds.net. There's a lot of betting markets out there. The betting markets firmly remained that uh, believed that uh, Remain was going to happen after the post closed. Still 89% on. So you still could have made a, a lot of money on secondary markets as well. Um, so let's look at the U.S. elections. We saw similar things. I'm kind of going to go through this a little quicker because I want to look at some use cases here. We saw Clinton versus Sanders. Um, here, uh, Senator Clinton, she's in green. Bernie Sanders is in orange. 
Uh, we began monitoring this in October of 2015. During this period of time, I don't know what Jeremy or Alan did then, but you know we had a, we had an issue. I, do you remember that? It was an outage for like a month with uh, in January or December, right after this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, but but cons so many. consistently with sentiment, consistently. We saw that Bernie Sanders was ahead of uh, Hillary Clinton during that period of time. Um, the Republican primaries, uh, same thing, on sentiment, not just emotion, not volume, but on sentiment. Uh, here we see Donald Trump. He's in red. I mean, look at this, this is point one, but that's a, that's a uh, consistent, consistent lead throughout the rest of the field. Now, I was, of the, I, I was still of the camp, even though I was watching this the whole time. I, I, I didn't believe that it was going to happen. But if I had read the signals, if I listened, I would have known. Um, now, let's look, even look at things that we can't predict through social media. Things that we can't predict. I can't predict who Donald Trump predicts, uh, picks to be his vice president. Social media has nothing to do with that. We, we, we couldn't know, right? Like, that's not going to tell us. But we, we started monitoring it. So that's somebody who, if Donald Trump decides he wants his wife to be his vice president, he can do that. That's the, within the American political structure, the, the, the nominee gets sole discretion of who they can choose. But we began to look at signals, see what people were talking about, where momentum was going, because that can be instructive. Uh, we looked at a combination of sentiment and volume. And with that, right the day of, we were able to identify that Mike Pence and Tim Kaine were going to be the two different uh, uh, respective selections. So here is, um, we call it the Veep Stakes. It's kind of a, a funny name. But we looked at three different people with uh, uh, Senator Clinton. We looked at a guy named Tom Vilsack, Tim Kaine, and Cory Booker. All very popular. When we look at sentiment, uh, we saw that Tim Kaine was consistently good. People consistently seemed to like him. He had a little dip there, but sentiment told us a story that, that Tim Kaine was going to be fairly popular. And by volume, we saw that by far he was going to be the most popular choice. So we posted that the morning that she selected. Uh, very similar with Trump, we looked at uh, Newt Gingrich, Chris Christie, Mike Pence, and Jeff Sessions. Um, and here we have Pence. This is his sentiment. Uh, throughout the week before, uh, actually it was the day before, his sentiment was fairly high, but his volume was also dwarfed everybody else. And so, you know, we could have been completely wrong, but oftentimes when we're asking the question, we can get very, very close to the answers. Uh, now, only looking at sentiment between May and November, we saw consistently, consistently that Trump had very strong sentiment advantage over uh, uh, Senator Clinton, Secretary Clinton. Um, we, we, there were times when Secretary Clinton was very unpopular and we saw Trump was very popular just looking at sentiment. But then let's go back to emotion because we talked about that in Brexit. And you know, we, we know that emotion can lead to behavior. If you're angry with something, then you might just go on ahead and do it. If you're happy about something, you're going to go ahead and do it. Uh, so we look at joy. This is from October 25th to November 8th, just the two weeks leading up to the election. Joy was the strongest emotion for any of the candidates. Joy for Donald Trump was the strongest emotion for any of the candidates. Also, anger toward Donald Trump. But even more telling, too, was how low joy was for Secretary Clinton. Because excitement about her was not very high. And so we saw enthusiasm toward her. There was a lot of enthusiasm for and against Trump, but not a lot for Clinton. And so if you look at the swing states they lost, uh, there was a significant problem there. Volume-wise, we saw that uh, uh, the tweets discussing Trump were very, very high, 75 to 25. And even between Republicans and Democrats, Republicans still were much stronger users of Twitter. And so we were able to understand through a combination of sentiment, uh, volume, 
and uh, emotion that, that Donald Trump had the momentum going into it, even though it was still really hard for us to believe. <laughs> Dr. Seth and I sat in his office for about 12 hours saying, I can't believe this is happening. Yeah, we, we didn't want to call it because our mind said, how can people rationalize, how can people vote for Trump? <laughs> and this was saying, it's Trump, 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 and very clearly, right? And, and so it was very hard, that's why we delayed. We could have said, um, uh, called it much earlier, but, uh, you know, we waited, uh, I waited till, what, 9 o'clock uh, so yeah. to make a call. But, and the, the yeah. other point, too, is that, that because of the U.S. election system, um, we weren't wrong in not calling it early because there is a popular vote com component. Now, the popular vote, does anybody here like, uh, you know, who, like soccer, right, or whatever sport you like, there, there are a lot of statistics involved, but only one statistic matters. That's the final score. So, in the, it, for instance, in football, you can throw for a lot of yards, but if you lose the game, you still lost the game, even if you beat the other team in terms of statistics. Uh, soccer, how many shots on goal, doesn't matter unless you actually made the goals. You can submit as many as you want. The yep. thing matters is how many are accepted. <laughs> yes, yes. So in the US elections, the popular vote is like that. That's how, how much, how many people throughout the entire country voted for you. But it does not matter if you don't win Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, Georgia, Florida. Florida. Not Georgia, that's pretty much a given. Well, I, you know, Florida. So those states are very important. The morning of the election, the morning before, before votes closed, Alan had been up here all night because the system crashed, uh, you know, working his tail off. But the morning of the election, we posted this on LinkedIn and on Twitter, where we said, going in, we see the, the sentiment differentiation uh, at... I think, it, yeah, about 50.1%, uh, 50.01%, and uh, Trump at 49.8%. Very, very close between the two. That's where we saw the popular vote coming out. We were within 1%, 1% of that breakout between the two candidates. So sentiment can be very, very important going into it. Um, now let's look at the battleground states. So, you know, we didn't call it until 9 o'clock that night. But at 1.15 that day, Dr. Sheth posted something on uh, social media where he looked at emotion, and I sent this graph to uh, some clients we were working with, where I said in the four different states, pardon me, in, yeah, the three different states, Florida, North Carolina, and Ohio, we saw that Trump had a very strong advantage using the I voted hashtag, or the VOT star uh, uh, search term. We saw that overwhelmingly Trump was getting support in those key battleground states. In the U.S. Senate election, we looked at, at the individual states and said, okay, using a combination of uh, sentiment and volume, we called 9 out of the 11 uh, battleground states. And so we uh, looked, you know, how, how's our, uh, we looked at the presidential elections, monitored those, I know a lot of you people attended then. Um, but really, that's kind of the, the process that we used. You, you know, the key when you're doing these types of analysis, number one, know what question you want to answer. In an election, it's very, very easy. We know what question we want to answer. You know, who's going to win? This, this guy, that lady. We don't know. Uh, and so we look to social media. But how do you look in other areas? For instance, um, Let's 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 look at Uber. All right, everybody kind of knows who who here has used Uber before. All right, it's great, very convenient, right? Or if you view Lyft. Uber had some problems. It turns out that their CEO was kind of a jerk. That a lot of their drivers were being pretty horrible. And so at the end of last year, we saw a campaign online that was called Delete Uber uh, because there was. You know, a lot of very uh, contentious issues at play. So let's look at what this is, you know, pulling from Cognovi Labs from a real campaign from October, or pardon me, December 2nd to January 25th. Let's look at sentiment. Uh, you know, our, our, our baseline here is zero. What do we see going on? 
When you look at this, what does this tell you? Any volunteers? Jeremy? What was the question? What, 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 what does this sentiment chart tell us about Uber? This is just looking at Uber in general. Uber the brand. Well, the, uh, so this is what I see. So you had a trend, and yeah, there's a bunch of peaks and valleys, but if you took like, you know, the mean of that, it was fairly high, right? And yep. until about three quarters of the way through, there was clearly an event. Right. Yeah, something happened. And then here. after that, what happened was instead of going back up to where it was previously, now you see that the overall feeling has gone down. Yeah. So yeah, Uber was really high. People loved it and loved it. Something must have happened this day, and they didn't recover. And we can learn that from sentiment. What's instructive here too then is to look at emotion, and this is really where emotion can be very, very valuable. The dark red is joy. We also have one for lift, but we're not monitoring. I, I did not uh, hold for that. So the dark red here is joy. And if you look from that period of time, and then this right here is disgust, and then this is anger. Look at where anger is. Very small. People, you know, and you, people will post about this. They're angry that Uber did surge, uh, surge pricing. They're angry that their driver got there late, whatever it is. But what we see around that period of time, even a couple of days before, so we saw the sentiment drop on January 7th, but on January 2nd, we saw a big shift. What we, what we see right here, around this time, look at anger. Look where anger comes into play. Look where joy gets squeezed. If, you're, if, you're, if you own Uber stock, <laughs> If you're an Uber driver, if you're on the Uber board, what are you learning now? What does this tell us? Alan? Sell. Sell. <laughs> Sell. Get out of there. People are ticked. People are very upset. And we can't learn this. Sentiment may give us an idea, but we had no idea how mad they are. We had no idea, because we see anger's not going away. Joy is not coming back. Is, that, is there a stock price? No, this is, this is just Uber the campaign. It's, it's not a public company, it's a private company. Oh, it is private. It's a private company. Mm -hmm. And so this is, this is emotion. So these are, these are the emotions we're monitoring. Uh, we're seeing that anger, that joy right here, uh, much less than it was, and this is, as a percentage, sadness is uh, really high. I mean, sadness is interesting too. Sadness didn't exist before then. There was, there was no appreciable sadness uh, measurement before this date. Now it's one of the most, it's the top three most prominent emotions toward Uber. Disgust, also, you know, disgust prior, but I think in this context, typically we were seeing disgust as in they were mad at the drivers. Uh, here we're seeing is mad at the company, and then uh, anger, anger the other uh, the other component. So that's that's kind of one of the ways, really. And I think that this this measurement graph here, when we look at anger for the long, or when we look at emotion for the longest time, I always looked at emotion using the pie chart. Uh, so I would go pie, right here. And you couldn't see it. This does not tell you the same story. <coughs> this does not tell you the same story. Um, and you can look at a bar chart. Again, it does not tell you the same story. Uh, looking at area percent, that's really where the value of seeing it, the emotions over a period of time uh, comes in. Uh, any any uh, kind of other things that you're interested in? Any other topics that might be interested in exploring? So, uh, you know, doing this does require that you have a reasonable understanding of the problem uh, in application. Uh, so, um, if, suppose you are using this to decide whether to invest in the company or not. And let's say, say suppose this is a, this is a private comp a public company, then they will stock price, when to start selling the price. 
and um, uh, many companies which are uh, brand centric you know where they are much of the uh, you know they are they're powerful brands and that's why they are uh, important companies that that's why their stock price is high uh, the so called goodwill component of the st stock meaning the one that comes un intangible component of stock is can be very very significant right so it's not you know there there are there, there may be a produce some per, per, some company pro, uh, pro, uh, uh, a brand value uh, of uh, I, iPhone, uh, Apple is much higher and the goodwill there of brand value, intangible is much much higher compared to another company that also makes a very good phone, uh, phone but is not, does not have that very high brand value. Thus, perception of the people and how they look at your brand is hugely valuable in, 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 in estimating the you know, your, brand, uh, your, your stock price. And knowing that uh, you know that that particular thing is what is getting hurt, right? The margin of a product so sell uh, is not changing, but the goodwill part is changing, and that's why the stock is becomes much less attractive when something like this happens. Yeah. So, so one of the things that I uh, want to take a look. We have a campaign running for fast food. So, Wendy's, McDonald's, Taco Bell, those types of uh, companies, and I want to understand what's going on and. So I look at uh, the keyword performance. I see that on October 2nd, so Dr. Sheth mentioned something very important is you have to familiarize yourself with the topics. So I look at October 2nd and I see that there was a huge spike for Wendy's. The process I would then use, I go to the search here, uh, isolate, let's say, let's look at the past, um, oh, the past 30 days. So I will go here, go September 19th through today, go to yesterday, hit apply, and let's see what's going on with Wendy's. It helps me to better understand what questions I need to ask. So if I own Wendy's stock, if I eat at Wendy's, if I work there, if I'm consulting with them, or if I want to understand American fast food behavior or why they post about it, this is what I would do here. Uh, and better understand why they had such a volume spike and see if that volume spike coordinated with a sentiment spike or other spike in emotion. So I see their volume spike on October 2nd. Let's go see. It looks like there may have been, uh, well, that almost co it seemed to uh, coincide with a, a sentiment dip followed by an, an immediate sentiment spike. Um, what I would want to do then is go isolate that period of time and see what topics are big. So we see that they, they had 84,000 tweets on one particular, particular topic, this calculator or your laughless clown. And so <coughs> what happens, it looks like Wendy's had a particular tweet um, where they had a, uh, something that was caused a lot of disgust, but it also seemed to have a high sentiment score. Uh, it says, please, they eat us now, they eat us later, adding up our wins on a calculator, you're a laughless clown. So they had some rhyme. I don't understand what it is. I have to go look into it. But this is something that, that often is very, very helpful when you're doing your research is to go into the individual tweets uh, and you know, go and actually, a lot of times what I do too is I'll actually go on my individual Twitter feed and go look at the, the person who posted the viral tweet, go better understand it, and dive into it from there. Um, so that's you know that's something that is, you know, when I'm trying to say, well, why was that spike? Now this may have been inconsequential. A lot of times this is a very funny tweet that has no meaning, might get retweeted, you know, a hundred, two, three hundred thousand times. People will put that stuff out there, um, and so that's. You know, just something that, that that's a process that uh, as you ask the questions, um, you need to dive into it a little bit. Uh, one kind of, uh, let's see, what's the, uh, oh, it's on Twitch. So I was going to look at the Star Wars campaign um, and show uh, the example of the, the DVD. But are there any questions, um, you know, as, as people are using the tool, uh, anything that you're you're kind of wondering, or if there's any analysis that you'd like to dig into? Yep. So, what uh, any election campaign, 
the right to vote is given only one, once to a person. Mm -hmm. But in this case, uh, the same person, if he tweets more number of times, that doesn't indicate his favor towards a single candidate. Because we should consider his tweet only once mm -hmm. to vote, I mean, to track that correctly. So how this is going to help? So I think that's a, that's a great question. Um, and I think the, the, there's a couple of ways to answer that. And to me, there's not, there's not one easy answer to that. You're exactly right. You can only, I can tweet that I love um, Hillary Clinton a thousand times, but I only get one vote. So what does that matter? What I think we do is we see, um, and let's look at this, there's a Senate race in Alabama, right? Alabama, uh, the really, really kind of, it's a different culture there, very unique political culture, and they have a couple of very, very colorful candidates running. So people, uh, one guy's kind of really um, controversial. And so what do we see when people are talking about him? Uh, the way that I view it is that the number of tweets, the sentiment, the uh, the emotion, tracked over a period of time, can tell me the story. I may not be able to say exactly what that one person is going to do or exactly how many people are going to vote. But what I can say is that if someone does vote a th tweet a thousand times, there are probably a number of people that follow them that also feel the same that aren't tweeting. I can go and monitor for number of retweets. I can modify for number of followers. And we found that when we do that, we really actually don't get a lot different score. If you recall earlier from the Brexit analysis, where we showed the volume breakout and we limited for retweets, we didn't see that the breakout was significantly different. It was three or four percentage points. Which in a tight, you know, if we're seeing a, you know, if it goes from 51 to 48, that might be a difference. But when it's only going from 35 to 37, that's not much of a difference. So, th I mean, there's a number of tools within here, and that's something we can look at right now. So, Alabama, and, and even more to the point, too, is I can look at the Alabama race, and I can look at this and I say, wait, hold on a sec. Let's look at the past week. Because um, this is, I think, one of the cooler features. I see this guy in red, his name's Doug Jones, and he's supposed to be the guy who's going to lose. But on sentiment, it looks like he's doing pretty well. But what does that matter? Because I'm looking at all the tweets in the world. I only care what people in Alabama think. So what we can do here, we can limit uh, with this really cool feature here, um, Jeremy and Alan built, that allows you to limit tweets by geography. And so I, I go into the United States, and I go, I think that's Alabama, okay. Now my geography, there we go, Alabama, all right, double click right there. And I have 11,000 tweets that I can look from at Alabama over that period of time. So now I'm getting a lot closer to who may actually vote. The people in Alabama that are tweeting about it, because so I don't care what someone in Ohio says. From there, I can go and I can look at the tweet volume, and let's look at, I always like to look at this in a pie chart for my initial analysis, and I actually see that Doug Jones, the underdog, is getting more tweets. Excuse me, to answer to her question, uh, do, you, do you think that uh, in, the in the my left side, which is I think your right side, right here? so we can, yes, we can actually use filter tweets, and yep. by the time, we can focus only on uh, unique users. Yep. So this is a, a solution that we can use in Twitters and as an answer to her question, I believe. Yeah, that's a very good point. I was going to get there, too. It's, it's not technically unique users. It's just not retweeting. Not retweeting. Yeah, so not retweeting. it's only user. So it is not retweeting user, right? Yeah, right. But yeah. you still have a user that posted yeah. 16 unique yeah, tweets. Yeah, because she said yeah. if one person retweet, so, but by that option, we filter the tweet, so we avoid retweet, right? Right. Yep. We may want to implement a feature where, for the chosen period, count only latest tweet from one that person. Unique user. Yeah. So, so th that's what we can do. We can look here at emotion. I want to go and say, okay, what are people saying? 
we look at the emotion, and it appears that this Doug Jones guy it's is doing quite manually, well. we are doing, Dr. Shed. Hmm? Currently, we do manually. Currently, hmm. for example, for our trends, yeah. uh, for Mariana organization, so we yeah. collected, and then we separated the retrieve, retrieve unique user and... But it should not be that... It, but the challenge with retweets, too, to me, one of the challenges there are is that when somebody retweets something, oftentimes, you know, usually people in actually their Twitter bio will say retweets don't mean endorsement. But oftentimes it does mean an endorsement. And so by, by limiting retweets, I may still actually be hurting my signal. And so that, that's kind of the, you know, one of the challenges we have to deal with is if I go and say I uh, want to support Doug Jones, so I retweet somebody, but I don't personally go and tweet something, then by filtering that out, I lose that signal. And so I think that's important to get data from both sides, to actually walk it down from the top level and go down more granular, and then see if the signals are different. If they stay the same, I think you have a pretty good idea about where you're going. If they change drastically, then you need to go and start doing your research a little bit more. So yeah, we can do that. We have, we go, okay, no retweets. Uh, you know, on here, on the emotion side, it looks like it stays the same. Volume side, it looks like it stays the same. Sentiment, I'd have to kind of dig in a little more. It doesn't look too different. There, let's see the difference. Yes, yeah, sentiment, we're about the same. Emotion, it looks about the same too. Uh, a little bit more scattered. We're losing some volume there, but the volume breakout is 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 about the same. <coughs> and here is, uh, what is the topic? Why do they you are? This is uh, two candidates: Doug Jones and Roy Moore, Alabama Senate race. And we're, so right now we have a very granular look at Twitter users in Alabama, and so we can, you know, oftentimes if we don't have great volume, additional filtering doesn't help a lot. It actually kind of. Uh, you, you lose a lot of the signal there. But uh, then you also have you know, the number of followers. So if you want to see if there's an influencer user, anything like that, those are just a lot more details here that we can look at. Another component here is we can go and filter by emotion or by sentiment. If we only want to see why people are angry, then that will give us a list and we can actually go into the individual tweets and make sure that our signals are correct. So um, that. Yeah, good question. I know I'm pretty much pushing on time now. If there's any other questions, um, otherwise, uh, Dr. Seth has my contact information. If anybody has any emails or if you want to chat further, I'm always available. Yeah. No, we don't have time problem. The class is longer. Oh, okay. The class is longer. How much longer are we going to go? We can go for another half an hour if necessary. Okay. I don't know if I have that much to say. We don't but, have to. Uh, okay. Yeah. I'd like to say about the uh, question. The uh, unique users. Uh, Dr. Sheth uh, posed that same thing the other day, and, and I disagreed with him too. So my my point was that, so in this case, we're not doing the Brexit thing where we have I voted, where we're actually looking for the individual votes. Right here, what you're looking for is influence, right? And so by limiting those to unique users, you're cutting out a lot of tweet volume, and the people who are tweeting that high volume are being listened to more. Right, so the effect and of that tweet is important. Right? And I think that's one of the important keys to note too. So there's a lot of discussion about Russia influence on the U.S. campaign, and you know I assume for a moment that that Russia did not compromise any voting systems, and all they did was send bots on Twitter to say I love Donald Trump a million million times. None of those bots could vote. None of those bots, you know, really got a lot of engagement. Um, so did it have an impact? It, that remains an open question. What we saw, you know, consistently through a lot of the sentiment, well, certainly they had an impact on what we saw, but we did create a likely bot filter that helped us uh, narrow down there. But so that, that if, if you're constantly seeing the same message, it certainly has an impact on people who are using Twitter. You know, it may have an impact on their perception if they say, well, uh, everybody loves Donald Trump I'm seeing on Twitter or everybody hates Donald Trump I'm seeing on Twitter. I would feel wrong if I didn't love him or hate him depending on what message you're getting. And repetition legitimizes. Yeah, repetition legitimizes. So, right. so, so again, are you 
observing the influence issue are you in, uh, observing the branding issues then uh, you don't want to uh, curtail or go for any user uh, but then uh, on the other hand if i'm uh, replicating uh, exit poll what you right. then i want that That's so it depends on what problem right? yeah. in this case we're not doing that yet right, right? but right. when you get to that point right. and you want to say how many people are doing right. that well then, then yeah. it's easier to do that though one of the problems is the, the query isn't really suitable for, for doing that. Yeah, but I, I actually, I'll way tell way, you, there may be. So it depends on what level of analysis you do. So just just look at this here. Okay. And I would, I would know if I'm really uh, doing political analysis, which of these are urban counties and which other rural counties. And I would want to, for example, uh, uh, get a rough idea as to whether uh, there are enough, uh, sig enough signal from different parts, which are still influential. And if I want to do that kind of rough analysis, again, it would be nice to be able to see that point. So rural vote versus urban vote divide. If I want to say, um, do I have enough signals from urban votes? Uh, can I, uh, for example, um, uh, uh, normalize urban versus, suppose the state has 50-50 urban and rural divide, let's say. And but the number of signals, tweets coming from urban is 75% and uh, uh, rural is 25%. In that case, I may want to sample just the uh, one fourth of the one third of the urban votes, uh, urban signals, and combine with thing to get a another uh, you know measure. So in these cases, there may be values. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and so I, I think that that's, that that's the important part is you try to collect data at every level and identify any inconsistencies there. If you're seeing consistencies across the board, then you have a, a really really strong signal. Yep. Uh, can we see the um County level uh, emotions and sentiments or Yeah. County level? Mm -hmm. Yep. So let's go here to, uh, what is it? Is it, what's the most populous county in Alabama? It's uh, Birmingham, right? Yeah. Uh, mobile. Mobile. So we'll look here. There, we have 500 tweets we can look at. So we can actually go into the county level. And you can still pull the data from there, um, you know, clicking on your, your download function. Uh, so you can pull the data in a CSV or a JSON file. Um, you can even look into the, uh, the the city level as well. There, there, are, there are also typically you want to do uh, you know some validations. So for example, I would take a rural county, and I would uh, look at uh, sentiment. And if I see that even in the rural county, uh, uh, it, it, typically I would expect that in the rural county, Roy Moore is doing well. Uh, he is the Republican candidate with very, uh, you know, extreme views. And uh, if he is not doing well, I would question what's happening here, and make sure. So, what is it that, that you really have to develop um, uh, a feeling, a gut feeling, whether indeed you are getting the right signal or not? Mm -hmm. What if, for example, the uh, the discussions you had? What if you are not defined caref campaign carefully? What if you are you have keyword that is getting too many other tweets that are not relevant mm. to this particular issue or campaign, right? Then uh, you'll be getting signal a lot of tweets that are not relevant to the particular thing, right? So uh, I think these are the things that you have to think about. Uh, what if I were to uh, only focus on candidate but not uh, not not talk about anything about party? Again, that could be a problem. For example, in Indian election or in a Turkey election, the person is very important, right? Erdogan or Modi are extremely important. And uh, if you uh, talked about the respective parties, and you look at party signals, they are not going to be very indicative uh, of, uh, you know, this thing. It, it, so it, suppose you de define the campaign incorrectly and not incorporated the right person, that's a problem. Or right, right, you know, topic or keyword or entity or whatever. So we have to be able to look at this problem and see if it's explainable, mm -hmm. right? And that's, the other, that's another very good point, too, is oftentimes one, one of the things that helps me as much as anything is the network graph. So if I want to know and understand who's, what I've always tried to do is look at an individual component, the network graph, the sentiment or volume, and say, just if, I, if this is all I'm looking at, what does it tell me? And if all I'm looking at right here is the network graph, I would say, well, looks like Doug Jones might win. 
he's bigger, he has very strong connections. Uh, Roy Moore's not getting a lot of connections. Um, and so people are using his handle and they're talking about him. And I'll tell you one of the things that was most instructive to me in the U.S. election. <coughs> and if you remember, a very horrible event on March 15th, uh, 2016. It was March 15th, 2016, there was a bombing at the Brussels airport in Belgium. Very horrible event. And I launched a campaign right after it happened because I just wanted to see what people were saying. There were a lot of people saying, uh, you know, prayers for Brussels. A lot of people saying, you know, get the terrorists out. But then I went and looked at the network map. And I still remember this. The network map had one big, big bubble and a lot of tiny, tiny, small bubbles around it. That one big bubble said, real Donald Trump. He was not the president. He has no demonstrable experience in foreign policy. He, why would people care what he has to say in such a real event? And he tweeted something, you know, kind of a, a extreme, and people were talking about how mad they were at him or how much they agreed with him. And instead of worrying about the actual event, people were talking about him. And I said, a thought crossed my mind. This was before people still thought he could win. I said, people can't change the channel. This guy is his show. And so that, that's one of the things I, I would also recommend is when you're looking at an event, maybe it's about Nike, maybe it's about uh, uh, a natural disaster, whatever it's about, go and look at the network graph and try to ask yourself the question of, what does this tell me? Um, if all I'm looking at, I don't see sentiment, I don't see volume, I don't see emotion, what is the network graph telling me? And oftentimes that might, that might be kind of that missing component that really helps you better understand what uh, uh, the whole story or what's going to be happening, what people are talking about. Um, any other questions? Did, did you have one? No, uh, did you? Oh no, I just had the, I don't know whether this is a good suggestion or not. And sometimes for analyzing this kind of emotion, we have to consider more than one or two entities and according to our subject, or title or topic. Because, um, yeah, you in a sentence, you might uh, find joy or sadness. Yeah. But it's not referred to Trump. It's not referred to someone else. Also, I'm talking about his wife. Yeah. So, but you consider that's my... Um, my emotion is positive, or my sentiment is positive to uh, Trump, or negative to Trump. But it, but in other hand, I'm talking about something else. But that's yeah. why but relationship Farah, between two is, entities is important. The Farah is what happens is that if you are saying positive about Michelle Obama, you probably are saying positive thing about Obama, uh, uh, you know Barack Obama also. So so you know you can't no, completely we discount. No, can't say like that. So I I I don't mean that. Uh, okay, Barack Obama is good president or not. So this analysis is not correct. So I'm talking about the, oh, Michelle as a woman, her style, her what, how she's thinking, but it doesn't, there is no any relation between her. Um, that is indirect relationship. So suppose you are a Republican who hates Barack Obama, you are unlikely to say anything positive about Michelle Obama. Yeah, no, I think that's, a, that's but, important. That, but that, if you want good narrow, for some analysis, that's uh, that's it's, it's still this is I, I believe this is noisy. They talk. Yeah, we well, have I, to avoid from this. Topic. Yeah, I, I think that's that's an important component too. Yeah, relationship we, between these different entities in a, in a uh, sentence or in a data is important. Yeah, I, I think that's one of the things that we we try to look at too is how you keep digging in and to find out what the score is because I've had situations once where I was looking at Costco. Right, and I, I saw on one day, on one day with Costco, there was a huge, huge spike in tweets. I actually think it's the campaign is on Twitch. Was, uh, hopefully, I'm logged in. I forgot my password. No, that's Twitch is too. Um, I saw a huge spike. No, I'm not logged in. Oh well. Um, I saw a huge spike. And it turned out someone was making a joke about Costco. And it was a huge spike in sadness. So it was completely noise. There was nobody cared. Yeah, it wasn't it was fully immaterial. So you isolate that and you kick it out and then you, you move forward. So yeah, I, I completely agree that there's you have to and if there's tons of high volume, you hope that that high volume ends up kind of just squishing out the noise. But if you're dealing with 
only 25,000 tweets, then you know you need to you need to be very judicious how you read those results. And I've found that just playing around with the tool as much as possible, uh, going in and making sure that your analysis is not bad. Um, so if here I'm looking at Roy Moore, and I'm only looking at discussed positive sentiment. And I can go in and say, what tweets are triggering? What tweets are triggering this? You know, why would anyone vote for an Alabama GOP candidate? The, that guy. You know that. So you go and you say, okay, what 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 lessons? What takeaways here? And then still, how can I do an analysis that's going to be fair and correct? And I'm not just kind of biasing my results. So yep, completely agree. Any other thoughts? All right. Well, I will say that, that we're done before he comes back. <laughs> I didn't mean that. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much.